So, where we were last lecture is, um, so this is the part that we are going to fix, okay. So, this is the mistake, this should be 250 and this should be 6, this should be 3 by 4 and then you get 54 megabits per second, that is a correction, okay. And uh, so, then we went into transceiver architectures, that was the main thing. So, I wanted to refresh that because I have not completed the 0F part yet. So, um, the problem with, um, uh, you know, heterodyne, what was the main problem with heterodyne conversion? Hmm? Image, image was the issue, right? So, uh, so then, um, then we went into 0F and then we are talking about what are the issues with 0F technique, right? So, uh, let us go over them again, okay. This is all we have done before. So, I think this is where we, we kind of uh, stopped because we ran out of time, okay. So, one of the, I am um, just using this to show you the pictures um, um, so that um, I can save some time, all right. So, this is uh, one of the issues with direct conversion is uh, the LO frequency. What is the LO frequency here? for direct conversion is equal to F R F right, same as, uh, uh, same as our, um, uh, I mean LO frequency is equal to F R F and F R F is coming in. So, um, what happens is this LO, LO uh, amplitude is pretty large as you will see when we look at the mixer design, right. And uh, since it is a large amplitude because you are doing switching, you are turning on and off, on and off, that is what you are doing to mix, right. So, um, the switching part, uh, this large amplitude will leak through devices. You will have devices, their, their capacitances and it will leak to the output of the LNA, okay. And we know that each LNA, no matter what you do, will have some coupling back to the input, okay. I mean, you can improve it, you can reduce it, but it is never zero. So, you will have also coupling over here, which will bring it back to the input of the uh, LNA. Also, there is uh, this LO is somewhere on the chip, right? So, it is thumping a uh, large signal uh, on the substrate and the, the pad, RF pad, which is where the wire bond is connecting from outside, right? So, that pad acts as a huge capacitor plate under which there is a substrate. So, if the substrate is thumping with large signal of LO, then it is going to couple back into that, that pad capacitance, okay? Is that clear? So, all these things eventually what happens is it will be transmitted out uh, of the antenna. Is that clear? Okay. So, this is the problem, the LO leakage problem that you have to worry about uh, when it comes to uh, and this is not good because what will happen is um, there might be somebody else um, right next to you who is also on the same channel and you become, uh, you, you are basically hurting, hurting uh, him to from receiving very weak signal because you are transmitting however weak it is, it is very close, so he will receive that first um, and that phone will get desensed, okay. So, that is the reason this LO leakage is important. The second part of the LO leakage is what happens is that this LO leakage, right, is transmitted outside. So, basically your LO frequency will, will go out from the antenna and it will get reflected from all different places or if you touch the antenna, you change the antenna impedance, right, and it is going to come back and mix with itself. Okay. So, if this, the LO uh, uh, leakage mixes with itself, what would you get out? What will be the frequency? You will get a DC output, right? And that DC will be in the right, uh, because we are doing 0F conversion, it will be right in band. I mean, it will be in band, right? I mean, it will be right there. Also, this DC amplitude will keep changing, depending upon what kind of reflections you are getting, how are you holding your phone you know, because you touch the antenna or whatever, whatever, it is in your pocket in, and you know, everything will change. So, this DC amplitude is going to change over time. Are you getting that? Okay. So, this becomes a problem. The reason it becomes a problem is changing DC offset is the kind of gains we have in the lineup, okay. So, typically let us say you have about 30 dB gain in the front end LNA and mixer and then rest of the gain is in the baseband. This part is called baseband. After you uh, down convert from mixer, then you have baseband filters, um, low pass filters and things like that, right. And eventually you have an A to D converter, right here, okay. So, there is about 60 to 70 dB gain over here and you have 30 dB gain over here, okay. So, let us see what is the impact of LO leakage uh, coming back in, okay. 
So, for example, you can say that it is LO leakage at the LNA input is let us say minus 60 dBm value, reasonable value. Okay. Then what will happen is um, let us calculate uh, value of the LO leakage minus 60 dBm is 1 e to the power minus 6, right. Uh, 60 is each uh, factor of 10 is uh, divided by 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 dBm, uh, 10 dB is so, 60 is 10 to the power minus 6. So, this is 10 to the power minus 6 milliwatt. 0 dBm is 1 milliwatt, right? Okay. So, that is where we get it. So, from this you can calculate the value of the voltage and the value of the voltage is, if you calculate it, it is going to be about 300 milli micro volts, 300 micro volts. So, let us calculate the gain is 30 dB. What is 30 dB? Factor of 6 dB is factor of 2. 6 times 5, 2 to the power 5 is going to be factor of 32. So, 32 multiplied by 316 micro volts that is going to be equal to 10 millivolts. So, the output of the mixer you are going to have some offset of the amplitude maybe 10, 10 millivolt. Is that part clear? Just straight away multiplication and the ADC input you will have about 60 dB gain which is 60 dB is 1000. Okay? So, this 10 millivolts gets multiplied by 1000. So, at the input of the ADC you are going to get 10 volts. Would you get 10 volts? what would you get then? It will be railed out to supply or ground, right? And this is the problem that you have with 0 IF and this is something that people have been, one of the problems people have been struggling uh, because of these DC offsets go straight through and um, you know it saturates the entire receiver. So, how would you fix this problem, right? What is the simplest way to fix the problem? Correct, correct. No, we, what we are talking about is, uh, we are talking about frequency which is coming uh, at the input of the LO is same as RF, right. The LO gets transmitted out and comes back in. So, LO multiplied by LO will give you DC, right. That is what we are talking about. So, effect of the DC offset is about 10, 10 millivolts. So, what you are looking at is DC is over here, okay. So, what, what is the easiest way to get rid of the DC? E101. E what do you use? Capacitor, right? You can use a capacitor. So, you can do something like a high pass circuit. So, people did that. So, what you do is you just add a capacitor out here, okay? Because you cannot add capacitor before this. Only once you get DC, you can block it, okay? Before that, it is all RF coming in. So, you cannot block it. And then what happens is then you need to, if you have a capacitor, then you need to bias it. So, you can use the resistor on the one side and you can, you can bias it. Now, what happens is that this uh, this RC filter, we just want to notch out DC and nothing else, right? Because you may have some information in the uh, in the entire spectrum. So uh, uh, this is what the response looks like once you notch out. Now one of the issues with this, it works. I mean, I have done this before. Uh, what happens is uh, this corner needs to be really, really low. Okay. So if you want a low corner, that means you want RC product to be very high. Makes sense? So, if RC product is high, which means you need large capacitors, right? So, which means uh, this is a very slow circuit, okay? So, if it is very slow circuit, then the DC is also changing. Um, you want to kind of really narrow, have a really narrow band filter there. So, very slow response is what you get for transients. If there is a transient in the, in the circuit, then uh, it takes a long time to settle down, okay? So, what people do is, uh, they keep, I mean what we have done is this resistor, you keep it adaptive. So, whenever, whenever you want to use the receiver, you initially reduce the resistance, get everything biased up and then you let make the resistance large so that, so what will happen is initially you would widen the bandwidth, get everything settled and then you narrow the bandwidth, very commonly used technique. Okay. And then uh, the next thing is, um, so as I said, large capacitance needed and then um, so, the next, uh, next way to solve it is uh, you can do DC offset cancellation. So, this is kind of how the thing evolved. Initially, uh, the first version of the receiver that, uh, that I, if you remember those radios that I showed you, we used the capacitor there. So, what we had to do was we had four capacitors which were going outside the chip and coming back in. So, it looked kind of an ugly solution, but it worked. But that was the first 0IF receiver that we worked on. But the next version, then what we tried to do was you can actually put a DAC, D2A converter. 
uh, all of you know what DAC is. You are many of you are doing mixed signal class, right? So, it is a D2A converter, which means what you do here is uh, follow my train of thought here. The output of the mixer is going through these filters, everything coming out at the A to D converter, right? So, at the A to D converter, you can figure out if you are having, if you are clipping, okay? You can look at the data and tell if it is railed out one way or the other, okay? So, then what you can do is you can make a decision based on that, all right? And then you can correct, um, correct that, um, that offset by, by applying a D2A converter. And the D2A converter is basically what does it, it only has this. You have a current sources and the current source is programmable. And if you have a resistor here, right, then you would change this bias voltage, okay. So, let us say there was an offset, this was plus 10 millivolts, like this. Then I can make the DAC work in the opposite way to make it zero it out, okay. So, the DAC will have certain current which will flow by which I can introduce artificial offset to zero out uh, the two, uh, two outputs, okay. So, the DAC only needs a digital input, okay. So, you can do all the calibration, a DC offset calibration and then you can hold that value. Is this part clear what I am saying? Which part is not clear? Why is it? Okay. You understand how the DC offset shows up, right? Yeah. So, you can have a DC offset of let us say 10 millivolts from the previous example, which means that the voltage on the top side and voltage on the bottom side is differs by 10 millivolts, okay. So, now what I can do is I can extract current from one leg and I can pump in current in another leg and artificially skew that offset to zero, correct. And that measurement, the data that I need to fade to the DAC is controlled by the output of the ADC. So, there is some logic circuit over here which will just look at the ADC output in that calibration mode and it will tell, okay, if I, my output is so high, then I am going to tweak until you get it to zero, okay. So, it is like a feedback loop, that is it. So, all this stuff is done in digital and you just tune it out to zero, that is what. The, the beauty of this is you do not have that notch because once I set that DAC uh, digital data input, then uh, it is like, uh, you know, completely, uh, th there is no notch at DC, hmm. correct. But you miss the one important point, right. If I do not have DAC, then what happens? If I, if I have 10 millivolt of offset here, what will happen at the output, at the input of the ADC? What will happen? No, no, no. What will be the value? We just calculated the gain, right. There is 60 dB gain. So, 10 millivolt becomes 10 volts. So, it will saturate to VDD and then you cannot do anything about it, okay. That is the reason. So, so that is the reason you, you have the ADC feeding back the um, DAC and you are tweaking it till you get it right in the middle, okay. So, you remove the DC offset, yeah. Of course, very good question. So, what you do is this will keep changing, right. So, then you have to go through a calibration cycle uh, every so often as soon as you figure this out, okay. But it is all kind of automated. Most of the, most of the receivers that we use, right, they work in time domain. Um, so, before that you can do some kind of zeroing and you can go in like that. So, so this can, this can work that way. If you have this technique, then it takes that much time for it to settle down, you know, whenever some change happens, okay. Okay, so there is a power up calibration based on the ADC, which is stored, okay. And then uh, it is fast reacting because it is just like uh, you are changing, storing the offset values. And the DAC digital support circuits, they are very area efficient. You do not have a large capacitor, but you have some small DAC with some tuning capability, okay. So, the important aspect there is a DAC resolution because DAC resolution will decide how close can you correct that DC offset. And you do not have to correct it to zero. Some offset is okay as long as the gain does not um, really, uh, you know, rail out your um, input of the ADC, okay. Is this uh, part clear, Vinish? No, it is voltage actually, right. It is output of the mixer is actually a voltage across the resistor. So, I am just tweaking that correct, right. Yeah, the implementation can be, uh, there are a variety of implementation for offset cancellation, but m you can do it. I am just showing you simplest example to show you how to use a DAC. Generally, you can always do a summing, subtracting oper operation, right, at the output. The next problem, which is an, a specific issue with 0IF uh, transceivers is the following. 
So follow my train of thought again here. So we have LNA, okay, which has some nonlinearity, second order nonlinearity, and then we have a mixer, and this is where our omega LO is, right? So this hashed portion is a desired portion of the spectrum, and now I have two tones in the in the spectrum which are very close to each other, F1 and F2. They don't have to be close to our desired signal. So the LNA is going to have a second order distortion. Okay. So if you have a second order distortion, what do you get? F1 plus F2 and F1 minus F2. So if they are F1 and F2 are close together, then what would you get? You would get a tone very close to DC, all right, which is F2 minus F1 in this case. Okay. And you will also get the original signal plus the desired signal, this desired signal. Okay. Because it's an LNA, correct? Now, the mixer also, because it's made out of real elements, it also has a feed through. What does feed through mean? Whatever is at the input will show up at the output because of some coupling of the capacitances. Okay? So this part, which is at low frequencies that we are seeing, will also show up at the output okay? through the mixer. Okay? Got it? So subtle point. So that will show up at the output, which is the second order component due to, uh, due to the LNA. On top of that, you will also see your down converted signal, okay, which is the down converted signal. So now you have corrupted the desired signal. So the subtle point again is the LNA gives you the second order component at low frequency and it just couples directly to the output of the mixer. And that's the reason it lands up in the desired portion of the band. And so this is basically, um, you know, the sec even order distortion uh, from the LNA is a problem in this case. And this is a problem with a, uh, with a zero IF technique, okay. So, uh, you know, what do you, how do you fix it? The fix is very simple. You can use differential circuits to improve IIP2, okay. If you use differential, then this problem kind of gets alleviated, okay, all right. Okay, so next problem is um, flicker noise. Okay. Again, we are going back to this, uh, this topology right here. We have a mixer and this is our, um, so uh, at the output, at the baseband, we have a whole bunch of circuits, right? You have baseband filters, all of them will have 1 over F noise. And that 1 over F noise is going to be in your desired band of interest, right? So that is going to reduce your signal to noise ratio per two cell. And on top of that, the mixer by definition, we are going to see when we are going to go through mixer, we are going to start today hopefully. Um, mixer will also generate 1 over F noise, okay, because of the way it works. Um, and that, uh, what happens is then you have this 1 over F noise due to mixer and the baseband, uh, baseband filters and here is your desired, uh, you know, desired band. So you will get, your SNR will reduce because of the uh, 1 over F noise, okay. So, um, 1 over F noise and DC offset, they are kind of have a similar impact, okay. Uh, because 1 over F noise by itself, it gets higher and higher as you go close to DC, right. So, how do you fix that, um, okay. Um, what you can do is something called chopper stabilization of the mixer, okay. So, what you can do is um, you can chop here and you can chop here. Um, I'll explain what that means. Uh, nobody knows what chopping is. Do you? Oh, didn't we do that in analog class? One of the chopping techniques? No. Okay. Let me explain it to you. So what happens is, let's say you have a um, you have an amplifier, right? The we can say that amplifier has an offset. Okay, which is um, V O S. For given amplifier, that offset will be certain voltage with certain polarity, okay. Um, and it will change as you choose different, different amplifiers, right. And we generally show it at the input like this, okay. So the signal coming in, so what that means is that once I will connect VI this way, okay, for one clock cycle. And the next clock cycle, I will flip the VI sign, all right. So then you're going to say, what's the output going to look like? The output is going to look like this, and VI is riding on top of it. 
okay, because I am flipping back and forth. So then what you can do is you can flip the output also. So you have two inversions in the signal path. So the offset gets converted, offset does not, has only one inversion in the signal path if you see because I am, okay, so let me draw the picture so it will be clear to you how it looks like. So to do this what you do is you have, these are switches. So once you can connect the signal like this and in other clock cycle you can connect it directly. Okay. So keep doing this at a clock rate, some clock rate and at the output also you do the same thing. Okay, is this part clear now? So when you look at the final output, the VI will look normal. So let us say I am putting a sine wave like this here. So at the, at the input here it is going to look like, something like this and at the output it will again look back same because I am, I am chopping it twice synchronized way. Okay. However, the offset signal now what will happen to offset? Offset will look like it will be riding on top of it. So offset will look like, like this and if you look at the spectrum of the offset what will happen? Where would it be? Would it be at DC? it will be at the clock rate, okay. So if you look at the spectrum, the, the, the spectrum looks kind of like this. This is your F, uh, uh, F chop and the offset shows up here, okay. So we just moved the offset to the higher frequency and this one we can get rid of it because it depends on your chopping frequency and you can choose the chopping frequency large enough so that you can filter it out, okay. So that's te this technique is called, um, you know, chopper stabilization or uh, there is another name I do not remember now, okay. Um, and uh, so if the offset can go to the high frequency, you can also get your 1 over F nice to go to the high frequency huh, by induction. Does it make sense? So whatever 1 over f noise you are going to have, that also we are representing like this, right, 1 over f at the input of the amplifier. So that will, it will show up like this, okay. So 1 over f noise we have shifted to um, high frequency and we can filter it out. So this technique is used, uh, you know, uh, actually I have worked on techniques like this before and they work pretty well, okay. So, uh, this is the solution, uh, chopper stabilization mix, mixer. You can design or do a good job at design and it is not a problem, okay. Of course, anything you add, it is going to be uh, bad. But then if you are judicious enough in terms of you have enough gain in the input, then you are good. You can do, do good job. Yeah. The signal has to be amplified, okay. The next issue with zero IF is the following, uh, called IQ mismatch, okay. So here are two paths. One is uh, the I path and Q path. So you know that we have cosine uh, being multiplying on one side and sine multiplying on the other side, right? And then we have this filter, right? So all this stuff looks great on paper, but in reality when you implement it with circuits, what happens? The two paths will not match, okay? So the two problems that you will have is the gain and phase in both paths is not going to be accurate because this thing is big and you know there is no, uh, I mean they will be matched because they are on the same chip but uh, you will have differences, you know random mismatches and things like that. So what, uh, what happens is then um, if, if there is a mismatch between these two outputs, IQ outputs, right, gain mismatch or phase mismatch between them. So if the gain between the two sides is not exactly same or there is an, a gain error or the phase is, uh, you know, not exactly 90 degrees but it is something different then uh, then you are going to have errors in your demodulation, okay, because this is what is fed to the A to D converters and the job of the A to D converter is to just uh, demodulate that signal. So you will not get the same data rate. So your a bit error rate will keep going up as, as the mismatches between these two uh, go up. So um, however, um, you know, nowadays as I said, you know, you can just use CMOS digital logic 
to fix this problem. Okay. So, what you can do is you can do calibrations. So, what you do is at the input um, you can switch in a known tone at the input and then you just measure at the ADC output what is the amplitude. Okay. And then you can say on this side I am getting this much output, on the other side I am getting slightly less output. And then I can store that, the calculation I can store in memory. All right. And then you can also, uh, then you do not have to do any corrections, you just have to make the calculation and store that information and the DSP takes care of everything. I like to use that word DSP takes care of everything. Okay. So, basically all these go into the DSP calculation coefficients and they know what to do. I mean they are really good at this stuff and uh, so you do not have to worry about it basically. I mean literally all the chips that uh, recent times I have worked on, they just put on this calibration module. Okay, We will, we have it under control. So, you do not have to design this over and over again. The DSP engine has um, you know all these features. Um, uh, they have they have done it over uh, many many years, so we can put that module and do the calibration. So our job as an analog RF designer is to make sure that we provide a known tone and um, or at a right frequency at the input for this calibration, and then it should have certain uh, certain uh, harmonic distortion uh, specification that you have to meet because you should not have any distortion in the incoming tone if, because the distortion will also mess up your calculations. That's the reason. Okay. So, all these things right, after you do all these things um, in, in digital logic right, then you can correct it and if you correct it to maybe 0.5 dB error, it is acceptable or 1 degree of phase error between the two paths. Um, so, this is like the goal for high end receivers all right. Is this part clear how to do this thing? Huh. This will change, this will change with temperature, everything it will change. Uh, no, no, once you do the calibration, you will get certain value of 0.5 dB error and 1 degree, 1 degree of phase error, right. Now, temperature changes, something happens, this will change. So, you have to store multiple values at variety of temperatures and all the information is there on the chip. The temperature information is there, uh, what kind of process you have, you kind of figured it out. So, um, you generally store it as a table and then you apply it. Many times you do this even versus frequency. So, it is like a whole spectrum is stored because the, this is frequency dependent as well also. So, uh, but I mean it sounds very complicated, but there is an app for that as I like to say. You know, they, 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 the algorithm is there and people have done it and they have kind of made it really nice. So, you, all your job is to provide a tone at the input and tell them what frequency I am going to put in and they will change that frequency, they will control um, and then they will uh, calibrate it out. But you need to know how it is done. Okay. So, I mean early days this was a problem, early days you had to kind of okay I keep changing till I get some analog output and then the receiver is ready to go. But now uh, and that kind of slowed down the usage of uh, zero IF because of uh, because you will have certain you will not be able to do high data rate um, you know modulation schemes. So, here now it is it is really uh, uh, efficient now I mean, almost everyone is using that right even with all these problems. The last problem that I want to touch upon is LO pooling. Okay, so um, I don't know if I uh, mentioned that earlier, uh, but you will have uh, this large LO, okay, um, pre, uh, which is going at the mixer input, and if there is a large RF signal, okay, because we always talked about sensitivity le sensitivity level RF signal, but sometimes you can be uh, that you can be very close to the base station and you're really getting large large uh, RF signal, okay. And now that large signal is not just large signal carrier, but it will have modulation along with it, right. Now that the whole thing is going to show up, you know, is going to couple to the LO output because of the same, you know, you have capacitances. And what it does is it will modulate the LO. This LO uh, is supposed to be, uh, you know, very good quality LO, but it will modulate the LO because of the uh, incoming uh, large signal. So, this basically not a good idea. So, you, you have to worry about this, this RF to uh, LO isolation uh, plays an important role and we kind of try to take care of this in the mixer design itself okay, to make sure that uh, this does not happen and you know generally you use cascode devices and things like that. So, you have to worry about all those things. Also, um, what happens is um, if your VCO is also operating at the same frequency right, then you have this problem because the VCO will also 
uh, VCO is a very sensitive circuit. It has one inductor, <coughs> one capacitor and a negative resistance. So if anything like that shows up on chip, then the VCO starts singing a different tune, literally. Okay, the VCO uh, will not give you that accurate uh, reference tone. So people typically what they do is they have VCO running at twice the frequency, two times LO. Okay, so that this problem doesn't uh, doesn't show up uh, because if it's two times LO, then the incoming RF part is already well filtered out. Okay, it's already filtered out. So the very large uh, RF input cannot at two times LO cannot come in. It's already filtered out. Okay, and the VCO is then only when you come close to the mixer you divide it by two. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the solution people use uh, for LO cooling. Okay. So, as I said again, despite all these challenges, right, the DCR is one of the most popular uh, approaches in recent times and it has really pushed uh, the RF uh, transceivers, CMOS transceivers envelope uh, to a limit right now as you can see, right, I mean almost every transceiver is uh, single chip integrated IC, okay. You have digital, analog, everything on the same chip and all these calibration techniques uh, the people have figured out. I mean, nowadays you will not see um, the RF piece separate and digital piece separate. I mean, it would be insane to see something like that, okay. So uh, I think all of you, I told you the story, the first, we worked on the first transceiver which was all single chip transceiver and then uh, what happened there was, this is in 1996 uh, when I was working on this. Um, uh, I mean, in a team, we had a large team of people who were trying to figure it out. And our goal was to bring out this single chip transceiver, you know. Uh, so, 0IF was the best way to do it. Uh, before that, you had to have these bulky filters, image filters. And that bulky image filter would make the radio like a brick, literally brick. And if you have multiple channels, multiple bands, then you have to have multiple uh, filters used to be there. And these are low frequency, 455 kilohertz, 10.7 megahertz type of filters. So, life was not that good. So, when we did this one, the size of the radio became very small, okay. But then you have to take care of all these problems. So uh, the first transceiver that we built was a single chip, but it had those, you remember that capacitors to notch out the DC? Those were outside. So we put the capacitors outside to notch out the DC part so that everything works. And the later part, um, uh, the later transceiver uh, that, that we worked on, we integrated everything together. And then, uh, you know, now since with the calibrations, uh, they are basically, uh, it's almost all automated. Uh, you don't have to do these calibrations manually, they are all automated. Every time that the radio starts, they do go through calibration schemes and it becomes all software game then. How do you uh, smartly design your software so that you can take care of everything and you know, get good data in. Any questions on the, the 0IF issues so far? Yeah. Negative frequency what? Huh. Can you speak a little louder? Huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the IQ. Um, I mean, which is what you read in that paper, right? The one that I gave you. No, you didn't read it. Huh? Okay. So we will go through that. I'll explain. Okay. So um, last class, right? If you remember this part, um, I kind of cheated to give you a feel that, oh, everything is okay, all I'm doing is downshifting. But if you have had, if the desired frequency, let's use a red color, was like this, okay. I intentionally chose it to be symmetrical to fool you, uh, that everything looks good if I just down convert, right. But then if I had this, something like this, then what will happen is you will get um, here, in this band you will get something like this and you will get something like this, okay. So you will get a flipped version on top of each other, right. And the only way you can decode that is through IQ uh, technique, okay. And that's what is there in that uh, quadrature signal processing uh, node that I gave you, right. Okay, alright. So let's kind of review that, uh, review the quadrature signal processing um, because this is what we are talking about, why do you do IQ? Okay. I think this first portion is pretty uh, straightforward and obvious, right? I'm scrolling fast, I'm sorry, but let me just find what I want to show you and then we can go through it. Okay. Let's, let's get through. 
I just want to show you the figures, right? I think this part is pretty straightforward, complex numbers, right? And um, and the the notation, I think this is the key part that you have to look at. So this is the um, this would be your um, rectangular form, and the most interesting part for us is either the the trigonometric form or the polar form. Okay, the amplitude and e to the pi or j phi. Okay, now um, when we talk about j, right, the the j operator, what is really going on? I think all of you know by now. What are we trying to do? J operator. Is there something really like j, the square root of uh, minus one? J is an operator, basic, basically, which uh, which takes you from by you move it by ninety degrees, right, in a counterclockwise. Is that part clear by reading this one? Okay. So whenever you multiply, let's say this was number, uh, and that's kind of the most important revelation, right? People get people use j, people know that j times j is equal to minus one, but they don't have that feel of physical interpretation or uh, understanding of what's really happening. Why are we doing all this stuff? Everybody can do a math example very quickly with j, with the complex numbers. But if you don't have that this insight, then you will have trouble in terms of looking at the spectrums. And as RF designers, you will have to understand the system aspect of RF design. And for that, you really need to understand how to do the complex uh, signal processing, quadrature signal processing, and deal with the waveforms, okay, spectrums basically. Because without that, it would be uh, very hard for you when we are mixing and things like that. Architecture becomes harder. So uh, the, the most important part is, let's say you have number 8, right? And this is on a real axis. First of all, real and imaginary, they are very confusing terms, right? Uh, it's just they have labeled those axes. You can call it X or Y. You can call it um, in phase or quadrature phase, okay? That's all you should use. Uh, don't get confused with um, imaginary doesn't exist and real exists. It's not like that. It's just decomposing your signal into orthogonal, two orthogonal entities basically, okay? So let's say this was 8 and if I multiply that by j, then what happens? It becomes 8j which means you kind of came to this side. So you, you went 90 degrees in a counterclockwise fashion. If I multiply that further with j, what will happen? You will come down over here on this side. And then what happens? 8j square becomes minus 8 and then we got minus 8. Again, if you multiply by j, it becomes minus 8j. And then minus 8j multiplied by j becomes, okay, j. So once you understand this, then everything uh, kind of gets it easy. You get it easy. And rest of the stuff is basically how do you, how do you get this e to the power j phi is equal to cos of phi plus j sin phi. This is the Euler entity, right? And I think it shows you how these are um, interchangeable, right? How do you get cos phi? And there is a proof for that. So, um, so once you get that, then we can start really talking about signals, okay? So for example, uh, let's say I have a signal which is uh, cos of, um, cos of uh, 2 pi f, what is it, f o, F O T, okay. So now we know that, uh, I mean, I won't go through the math proof right now, but I think you read it enough and then you know, what is this equal to? E to the power J 2 pi F 0 T uh, plus, right, E to the power minus J 2 pi F 0 T divided by 2, okay. So how do we go back to the, uh, uh, to this uh, representation, right, the, the IQ representation? Um, you can call it real or imaginary or i and q, okay. So what we do is, what does this look like? e to the power j 2 pi f 0 t, hmm? that would be this vector, okay, it's rotating in this direction, positive direction like this and the negative will be right here, it will be going in this direction, correct. And then when we add the two together, what will happen? The this part will get cancelled out all the time, the y-axis part or the imaginary part. And what you will see at this point, it will be here and it will move, it will go out like this. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, 
I can move my pen but you are not seeing the pen. So basically um, what happens is um, yeah here you can see that this is the cos function right rotates and this is in time how it is moving uh, it is rotating that phaser is rotating and then uh, the effective um, waveform that you are seeing in on the real plane is um, or the the in phase plane right you will see a cos 2 pi f 0 t. Similarly, you can uh, you can look at the representation on the on the imaginary axis and you are going to see uh, this sine wave ok. So, that is the main thing all right. So, once you understand that I think you are kind of in good shape and then we can take this to um, you know this understanding to frequency domain understanding. So, first of all you have to understand the time domain part, time domain part I think if you read and then you can understand those phasers how they are moving, it is just a projection on the real axis or the imaginary axis or in phase axis or quadrature axis right. The projection will look like sine or will look like a cosine. Now, now let us look at it, uh, look at it in frequency domain right. So, cos of 2 pi f 0 t this is represented by e to the power j 2 pi f 0 t divided by 2 plus e to the power minus j 2 pi f 0 t. So, e to the power j phi ok that is like an impulse function in frequency domain right if you do Fourier analysis right. So, um, if you uh, if you look at uh, e to the power j 2 pi f 0 then you get an impulse at f 0 frequency ok. And then the minus uh, uh, j 2 pi f 0 t will give you another impulse at f 0 ok. So, this the flat plane is the real uh, real or in phase plane ok and vertical is the imaginary or quadrature plane ok. Uh, now, these are not phasers ok. I think that is the most important point I would like to make. When you are looking at the time domain waveform. Um, we are rotating that phaser and we are looking at the projection right. But in frequency domain that does not happen. In frequency domain it is a delta function uh, that shows up uh, just like as uh, as one frequency all right. So, now uh, so the cos shows up as um, you know so I can draw it horizontally cos will show up like this correct and this would be your uh, f 0 and this will be your minus f 0 all right. And in sine case what do you get? In case of sine, if you look at the sign and its expression you will have a j and minus j. So, the, the positive part is a minus j right here and the, the negative frequency part is a plus ok. So, that is the way you represent sine in on the imaginary axis. Okay, got it. So, now you can see that one of them is in the in phase and other one is in the it is in the quadrature phase. So, they are orthogonal to each other right. So, I can carry data in each one of them separately and nothing will get messed up. See final output is only one voltage that is coming out there is no like there is a separate in phase output and separate uh, quadrature output. But we are we are putting them in the same bucket because we can decode them out separately. Right. That is the beauty of quadrature phase ok. But then you need two tones you need a cos and sine to multiply and remove it out which we discussed earlier right. So, uh, kind of hopefully all this stuff kind of will, will sink in now why are we having two paths i and q paths ok alright. So, the next part is how do we deal with it in the uh, kind of going back uh, from here. Uh, to show. Uh, so, for example, uh, let us take if you remember Euler's equation right what was Euler's equation cos of uh, 2 pi f 0 t plus j of sin 2 pi f 0 t is equal to e to the power j 2 pi f 0 t right that was the Euler's equation. So, in this case let us do it using a figure and uh, this kind of gives you a very good insight if you pay attention ok. So, for example, uh, let us look at sin. Um, so, cos of 2 pi f 0 t we already know ok. The flat portion is the real plane or in phase plane ok. So, you can see the cos is everybody knows right the cos is just two tones at f 0 and minus f 0 and sin as we said it is going to be positive in the negative frequency domain 
and negative in the positive frequency domain in the frequency axis right and also in the imaginary plane. So, uh, since we are doing j what does that do? j will rotate by 90 degrees correct in the anti clockwise fashion. So, this would rotate this way and this would rotate this way by 90 degrees ok. So, you can see this is the j sin 2 pi f 0 t are you with me so far ok and when you add these two together what happens? You will cancel out this portion and you will double up this, this portion correct and then you get your original tone which is actually the impulse that we are talking about j 2 pi f 0 t ok. So, once you know this then you can start playing with the spectrums. Once you are first you have to learn how to play with the impulse and then you start playing with the spectrum. So, in this particular case um, you know you, you look at the when you introduce this phi and then you can uh, also do the same thing. When you introduce the phi you can you can add sine and cosine and you can see that they are they're twisted in the positive and negative plane like this and you can extend it. So, once you know how to deal with the impulse then you can put bunch of impulses right and you can create a bandpass type of signal and you can see that you know hey um, I can show you this is twisted like this and this spectrum is twisted like this ok quadrature and in phase. So, these are all real signals except this one will be a complex signal ok. So, the real signal will always have positive and negative frequency uh, spectrum complex signal will have only one maybe ok. Now, comes the real example this is like uh, the, the whole reason we are doing it to get to this you know um, what I wanted uh, to be able to do is to teach you how to do this portion to, to how do you de embed uh, using quadrature signal processing the desired information ok. So, pay close attention and the previous one is all basics how do you get there ok. So, this is our original uh, original waveform and here intentionally we are making sure that the, sig the spectrum is not symmetrical because uh, I messed with you earlier by showing you a symmetrical spectrum and then you said wow I down converted and my job is done, but actually it is not right. So, once you look at unsymmetrical spectrum the life becomes uh, uh, then it becomes easier to see the mess up. So, this is the original spectrum and this is the negative ok and this is your F c minus F c ok and what do we want? What we want is only this part ok. So, this is the only thing that I want. And since I am going to digitize this at certain sampling rate right, then you will have this periodically coming in infinitely right. Once you sample you will have all these uh, things. Uh, now, they have to be far apart from each other otherwise they will alias with each other right. So, that part we do it by filtering and the sampling rate needs to be properly done developed this way. So, this is what we want because once I have this then I can process that waveform in digital domain this is what we want. So, how do we do that is the is the question right. Is this clear to you all of you? This is the starting point and this is the goal where this is our goal where do we want to go goal and this is what the uh, original waveform ok. So, how do we get from the original to this bottom part where I can I can I can basically confidently say that I can decode this thing ok all right. So, what do we do? So, let us look at um, the waveforms here. So, this is what we do and I think I have already shown you how. So, this is our uh, real bandpass signal x b p t and the bandpass signal is given over here ok and then we multiply it by uh, cos of 2 pi f c t and sin of 2 pi f c t both sides. So, the one that is coming out cos we just label it as in phase one that is coming out at uh, sin we call it quadrature phase this is nomenclature nothing else nomenclature ok remember that do not get confused. And then we filter it out and then we do a to d converter. So, let us see how we uh, uh, let us draw the spectrum at each output to understand how it is really working ok. So, the in phase what does cos uh, spectrum look like uh, the cos it will look like 2 two tones right. So, then uh, let me use a different color. So, the cost would look like like this and like this right. Now, when you multiply the two what do you do? Huh? 
you do convolution right we time domain multiplication so convolution so what do you do when you do convolution you take this you flip it around and you start scanning it uh, and you kind of run through it right so when i do that uh, everybody knows convolution right because that's something i don't think i can teach you in like so quickly i can but it's just that I just love to teach convolution and I'll take the rest of the 20 minutes. So um, I will prohibit myself from doing that, okay. So you, the, the simplest mechanics part of it is you take the spectrum, you flip it around and you just kind of slide it around and you plot the, uh, plot the spectrum wherever they line up, okay. So if I do that, I'm going to, so this part will give me this, okay, and this will give me, and will give me this okay convolution of uh, of only this part so sorry did i make a mistake let me delete that yeah okay okay so this part when it convolves with both minus fc and fc uh, you know after flipping it around you're going to get this Okay, and you're also going to get this. Is that part clear? Because when I when I take these two um, and flip them around and do this, you're going to get the green part. And then the um, let's draw red, which is right here. Okay, when when we go through this, you're going to get this part. Okay, all right. So we can see that this waveform is messed up. It has, you know, two folded on top of each other, and we cannot distinguish them. Once they get messed up, you cannot do anything. All right. So once I filter it out, this is what I'm going to get. So this is the I part we got so far. And now let's look at the Q part. The Q part is going to be again. Uh, what do we do in the Q part? What is the what does the spectrum of a sine wave looks like? You're going to get um, something like this, right? Correct. So when I flip it, this one hits first. So I'm going to get this part. All right. And when the second guy comes in on top of it, I'm going to get this guy. You really have to know this, okay? Maybe I'm not doing a justice to explaining this very well, but um, if you if you don't know the convolution, you know, kind of go back to basics or ask me later on, and I'll I'll show you how to do that. So you flip around the 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 two uh, you know sine part, and then you scan it around, and you get the red part. The red part represents only this portion, okay? And then when you go forward, you'll get the green part, which is uh, so this will give you this and it will give you this, okay. So again, I, when I, once I filter out, I'm going to get this as a quadrature, all right. And now we can see that I can easily take the two signals and we can, we can delete uh, one and you can amplify another one when you look at these two. Buttons. The dotted portion, we can get rid of it, okay. Now let's take a, uh, uh, is this clear? So uh, this is the, you know, we, we get rid of the dotted portion and we just amplify the, um, the one that we want. So here is it's in the, in the, um, you know, in, in the X and Y axis, uh, imaginary and real axis, okay. So when we, um, in a three dimensional view, right, again, um, the imaginary part is in an imaginary axis and then when you do the j sign uh, when you do the what we do is i um, uh, i f minus j q f okay that's the transfer function we are trying to do that's when we get um, we we take this q part which is on the imaginary axis and we minus j what does that mean you make it uh, clockwise okay so then i have to rotate it clockwise which is this way and then you can see this is a clockwise rotation, okay. And once you rotate it clockwise, then you can see that uh, the proper portions cancel out, okay. 
All right. So that's pretty much uh, you know, and once you get this part, and once you sample it, then it's easy. Then it's, it's just become multiple copies, and then in the signal processing domain, this is what we work. Okay. Then you do whatever you know, down sampling, up sampling, whatever what you want to do in a DSP. You know, uh, it's all uh, bits. Okay. All right. So um, is this part clear? I and I plus JQ. Uh, if it's not clear, um, you know, then then still go through it one more time. Uh, because from next class onward, we are going to do a lot of mixers and you know, you have to be kind of very conversant with this. And this is the, the reference where I found a good, um, there is a lot of, uh, he has made it interesting to understand, you know, with all these analogies, okay. There is another website, if you, uh, I mean, I would advise, since I have only two minutes, uh, it's called Better Explain. As a teacher, I have to kind of look at all these websites to see how you can teach it better. So this is another website which is called Better Explain. And there, uh, you know, a lot of people contribute, how do you really explain this? You know, how do you explain this in a simple term? And that's kind of where I figured all these things out. So um, uh, if you like, you can go to that website and figure out, then they have tons of math problems, this and that. How does the complex, what is this Euler equation? Uh, kind of same way, but there you have, um, you can actually play with, um, Visually, you can play with things to see how this thing is behaving. Okay, all right. Um, that's it for today.